he had to he had to have some some booze i i can't remember the, i know it wasn't beer it was like alcohol whether it was wine or whatever um that I don't, I don't remember that much about it. I just remember taking him up to Ridgeway a few times to the, to the liquor store or whatever, and he'd get his supply, and, and he, you know, we'd take him back home. My sisters, um, whenever he needed groceries, they would either pick something up for him or take him in, you know, in, uh, in the car with them, and he'd get what he had to get, and they'd take him back home. And um, but he was a, like he was a very well-mannered person, like I said, even, I mean, I met him a lot of times when he was, I don't want to say the, say the word drunk, but I guess you'd have to, but, you know, he was feeling no pain, but never a mean thing at that time ever really come out of his mouth, like he never degraded other people and stuff like that, he just wanted to be left alone, do his work, and uh, you go your way, I go, I go my way, so to speak, yeah. My name is Jill Brady. I was raised Jill Hancock here in Fort Erie my whole life. I met Tommy when I was 12 years old, and I was very good friends with him until um, he passed away when I was 21. Uh, my family lived next door to the Fort Erie bootlegger. And uh, when I was about 12, I used to walk back and forth every day from school I passed his house. I talked to him every day, and all his friends on the porch. Well, I was always very friendly, very outgoing. I wanted to know everyone and all about them. I was very curious. Um, anyone that was sitting on, you know, the bootlegger's front porch was fair game. They all had to tell me their life story, where they came from, what they were doing there. Tommy was no exception. Um, I followed him home. <laughs> I, 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 I plied him with questions that, you know, he willingly answered. He, he was very open about his life. Like him. He always wanted you to like him. And he would endear himself to you with these stories. He would make connections. A, a good example would be, he told me that his mother's maiden name was Hancock, which is my name, my maiden name. And that was just to connect us, I believe. I, I don't know that his mother's name was Hancock. It was just something that he could tell me that was a harmless, they, they weren't malicious lies, they were harmless tales that would just connect you to him more. I did. Uh, when I was about 16, I was home from school and Tommy was a heavy, heavy smoker. Um, so he had yellow, everything was yellowed. And he had these white ceilings in his kitchen and I thought, you know, I'm going to clean these right up. And I got a mop and a bucket and bleach water and took the mop along the ceiling. And as I went, all it did was streak the yellow everywhere. It was just a pattern of streaked yellow. I couldn't get this off or anything. And I was so upset that I couldn't get the house cleaned. And uh, Tommy, <laughs> Tommy thought it was wonderful. He, he thought it was my version of artwork. And he left it just like that <laughs> until it burned down. <laughs> Tommy always said that he was not an artist. He, he was just a painter. And I thought that maybe we could make some extra money by selling vases, painted vases, in, in my church. I thought that it would, you know, get him a couple extra bucks. And when I suggested it, it really offended him. <laughs> I think I insulted his talent. Although he said he never had any, um, he knew that he was very talented. And painting vases was the very last thing on earth that he would ever do. <laughs> People would be curious as to why a 63-year-old would want anything to do with a 12-year-old. And all I can say is that Tommy was very patient, very likable. I spent hours just sitting with him, you know, talking to him. He was never inappropriate, he was never vulgar or rude, he was always polite. There was a, a basic respect there. I learned things from him that I didn't even realize I was learning. I was a teenager. I was rebellious and I was emotional and, you know, unsure of everything. And, you know, he never treated me like a teenager. You know, he, he treated me like an equal. I could go and I could complain and vent all my problems and he would sit and he would paint or he would 
strum on his guitar or he would whittle or he would just listen. And, you know, he'd throw little comments in like, well, you know, isn't that the person that gave you that great birthday gift or isn't that the person? And he would soften my anger without ever really addressing it. And he was very good at it. Very good at, although he was very temperamental, probably more so than I was. <laughs> yes, Tommy told me that he had a daughter in Toronto. Um, further to that, I have also been told that he had a wife in Toronto, but it was the daughter that he only ever mentioned to me. Dad. He did tell me once that he had a daughter, and I know he's told other people that as well. And when I asked where she was, or who she was, or how old she was, he wouldn't give me any details. He wouldn't tell me her name. He wouldn't tell me where she was. He told me that some people are better, not, better off not knowing who their parents are. I don't think that I got that probably as deeply as I would now. You know, back then it was, you know, ever the optimist. Well, every daughter wants to know who their father is, and every... And I would ply him with questions. He wouldn't tell me anything. And he was, it, that was, he stuck to that. You know what, she's better off not knowing me was the impression I got. It, it really gave me a, a different side of Tommy. You know, a self-loathing or a, a guilt-ridden Tommy that felt that people were better off without him. Damn. Yes, he told me when he came across on the boat that he took his uncle's identification. He was only, I believe, 16 and he wasn't old enough to get on the ship or to get employment or and he needed the identification so he took on his uncle's name of Tommy Foster he said that wasn't even his real name again one of those questions that makes you go hmm <laughs> you're not sure if, if that's quite true or not but I, I don't know why he would have told me that story it, it really had no impact on our relationship he just shared that with me his name, he did not tell me his real name though, and I did ask, of course. He didn't share that with me, he just said that Tommy Foster was actually his uncle's name, and the reason he took his identification was that he was old enough to get on a boat and to come to Canada. And Tommy wanted to give me a present, so he, Tommy Style, gave me a present that would associate with my schooling. So it was a picture of, of Jesus Christ. And it's the very um, common one. It's done in like antique colors, like the golds and the browns. And it's just a portrait of Jesus looking solemn with the robe on. He did it from memory. And I know he doesn't do faces, he doesn't do people. But when we looked at that picture, when I got it home, and he was so happy to give it to me. But when I got it home, the, the picture was very similar to the one that you see everywhere, but the face resembled Tommy. It was Tommy's face as Jesus Christ. And uh, I'll never forget that, uh, thinking he obviously, you know, that's the face he sees in the mirror every day and maybe it just sort of played in. But yes, I have a picture somewhere of Tommy looking like Jesus Christ. <laughs> his spirits were always pretty good. When he first lost his legs, the first few years, he was a little temperamental. You know, you saw the loss and the grieving and the anger. Um, but when Tommy felt that way, he always, it always came back to him. Anything that went wrong in Tommy's life, he, he blamed himself. He was very self-recriminating. You know, the loss of seeing his daughter grow up, and I was, I was young. You know, yes, I, I, I could have fulfilled something for him. I hope I did. <laughs> his funeral had a big impact on me because it was one of the first dealings I'd had with loss, someone dying. And what struck me the most was that, to me, Tommy was so talented and so, there, there was pictures in so many people's houses all over Fort Erie. You know, he had that group at the bootleggers next door that he sat with regularly. And he lived in so many different places, even in the short time that I knew him. And there was only a couple of people at his funeral. It was a very short, graveside funeral. It, 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 it was missing a lot, you know. It, 
I, you felt lost. I was there and I, I was there for the service and there for the burial and then and that was it. You know, there was no memorial afterwards. There was no people talking about what they remembered or it just, it felt really empty for Tommy. I'm really happy about this. I, like I said at his funeral, I felt like there was something missing that there just wasn't enough. You know, I, his life seemed almost pointless. You know, from a 21 year old's point of view, I thought, what was the point? And when I heard that, that they were going to gather information and, and put something together for Tommy, it, it's 20 years later, but I'm, I'm so glad to see it happening. I, I think there was so much more to him. And, you know, a lot of people have these paintings in their living rooms, and no one knew the artist. And I, I think it's really important that, that people hear about him so that they have a story that goes with that painting. The fact that he painted for so long and, and he had such unorthodox methods in painting. You know, his paper bag crumpled up to do his leaves on his trees. Uh, he had a broken finger and I, I still remember him holding the paintbrush, you know, alongside and doing his feathering. There's so many stories of Tommy when his hands started to shake and he couldn't paint as well and how frustrated he was to not be able to get his vision out there. I'm, I'm really happy that people are going to hear about him and who he was and they might look at their paintings in a different way. Well, Tommy was a, he was a drinker. I mean, he was, and sometimes uh, when money was tight, Tommy would paint pictures in exchange for money for alcohol or exchange pictures for alcohol itself. And during those times, you know, he couldn't get his art supplies, the proper art supplies that he would normally paint on. And I noticed that later on in his life, a lot of his paintings are done on just about anything. Uh, they're done on Bristol board, um, linoleum, whatever Tommy could apply paint to that would get him money, he used it. And again, I'm going to defer back to the 1970s. Most of the pictures I've seen from 1970 and near that time frame are usually on better quality material. They're usually framed with the paper backing. I'm thinking that as he got older, money got tighter and uh, supplies ran short. But he still found a way to paint. <laughs> I, I had uh, quite a bit of contact with Tommy. Towards the very end of his life, um, I had been married and I had given birth to my oldest son. And the year he died, I gave birth to my daughter. So of course my life got a lot busier. But Tommy was still part of it. I, I think I have a photo somewhere of him holding my son as a baby. But he was ill and he was frail. And he wasn't, in a very short time frame from the Tommy I met in that decade that I knew him, he was a totally different person. You know, he got quieter and he got more introspective. He wasn't singing how I told you lately that I love you. He wasn't, you know, giving me art lessons. <laughs> He was calmer. I mean, I, I really like to think that towards the end, Tommy sort of forgave himself. He, he wasn't as temperamental. You know, I think maybe he found peace with himself.